皆さん、こんにちは。アートウィーク東京のオンライントークへようこそ。アートウィーク東京は、東京におけるゲンダーアートの創造性と多様性を国内外に発信する年に一度のイベントです。今日は、ニューヨークにあるアジアソサエティ美術館の館長を務める中森康文さんを迎えし、写真家、美術家は何を見たか、日本の写真における実験、1968から1979というタイトルでオンライントークをお届けします。トークでは、1960年代後半から70年代後半にかけての日本における写真表現の歴史を紐解き、特に2015年に中森さんがヒューストン美術館で手掛けた展覧会について、当時の展示風景も含めながら、現代の写真へのつながりについてお話を伺います。展覧会のカタログは、すでに入手がとても難しいため、そうした記録写真も貴重なものとなっています。なお、本トークは、すでに公開中の富井玲子さんによる、東京はどこにある、日本の1960年代美術をオペレーションという概念から考えるというトークともつながる内容で、富井さんの国際的同時性としての響き合いについても、本トークの中で研究しており、ご関心のある方は、ぜひ富井さんのトークと合わせてご視聴ください。では、中森さん、よろしくお願いします。Hello, this is Yasufumi Nakamori. My talk today will trace a range of experiments by photographers and artists in the wake of Japan's turbulent decade of the 1960s. Here, I mean the artists by those whose practice is primarily painting and sculpture, as opposed to photographers whose practice is solely lens based. As demonstrated in this talk, beginning in the early 1970s, Some artists began using the camera as part of their art practice. Until then, the practice of photographers and that of artists who use the camera hardly mixed. In particular, my talk will be based on the research I led to conduct for the 2016 exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston titled For a New World to Come. Experiments in Japanese Art and Photography, 1968-1979. The exhibition produced a catalog with the numerous essays by scholars and curators, including art historian Reiko Tomi and, and curator Yuri Mitsuda. The decade following 1968 might seem less eventful compared with the immediate possible years as a student protest And the vanguard art initiatives of the 1960s gave way to economic uncertainties, political apathy, and the introspective tendency in art. However, as this exhibition demonstrated, the decade of the 1970s was critical in the development of new directions in art in the form of photography as artists responded to social changes Through different avenues of expression. They were aware of trends emerging from North America and Europe, and yet they sought to generate and promote their own ideas and styles. They worked as individuals and as part of artistic collectives, and they displayed their creative output in printed publications and in independent exhibition spaces. Artists began to see photography as an effective medium for experimentalism and conceptualism. And photographers shared with the artists a critical awareness of the unraveling of the emergence of a new era. This new era was called Gendai, the contemporary, as opposed to Kindai, which means the modern. And the new era was marked by a great sense of international contemporaneity. In Japanese, Kokusai Teki Dojise. The exhibition and catalog for a new world to come. Experiments in Japanese art and photography, 1968 1979, examined the space for this cross pollinated experimental photographic discourse. In the history of post 1945 Japanese art and photography. Among other things, it revealed 
how this discourse anticipated the creations of contemporary art today, wherein photography plays a paradigmatic role in all areas of visual culture. Here, to show the historical context of the exhibition, I'm starting with the selections of photographs by Kazuo Kitai from his series, Barricade, 1968. Kitai, from within the student barricade at the School of Art at Nihon University, for four months in 1968, Kazuo Kitai traced the lives of student protesters who had shut the school and fought for its democratization and the transparency of the university management. He took photographs for the protesters' newspapers, which were circulated daily. Around the same time, the genre of protest photo books emerged. These photo books traced the protest against the US military presence, university student protest, and protest against the constructions of Narita Airport, among others. And they were published in a small scale and distributed among the other protester groups as well as general public. The title of this exhibition, For a New World to Come, is borrowed from Takuma Nakahira, a major protagonist in the dramatic changes and intersection in art and photography in the late 1960s into the early 1970s. The title refers to his first photo book, For a Language to Come, published in 1970, in which the photographer expressed his loss of confidence in language to articulate the complexity of time and explore the photography images as a possible way to supplement its role. Nakahira's photographs were often shot at night and towards a light source. He held the camera slightly tilted to nuance the uncertainty and fleeting nature of the time he occupied. These four uh, actually representatives of Nakahira's photograph from late 60s into early 70s. Nakahira, together with the poet Kojitaki, was instrumental in launching and editing a journal, Provoke, Provocative Materials for Thought. This was a short-lived journal of photography and text that appeared in only three issues from summer 1968 to winter 1969. Joined by two photographers, Yutaka Takanashi and Daido Moriyama, and one poet critic, Takahiko Okada, the collective orchestrated an edgy and radical discourse on photography through their words and their are bure bokeh style, meaning grainy, out of focus, and blurry photographs. This discourse attracted attention from the interdisciplinary audience in photography and art, and in literature and poetry. The iconic manifesto that opens the inaugural issue demonstrates their firm belief in the potential of photography in place of language, even though, open quote, image of and in itself does not constitute thought it lacks a totality of idea, and it is not the convertible sign like language, close quote. Yet because in their volatile times, open quote, language loses its material foundation, that is its reality, and floats in the air, what we, the photographers, can do is to capture with our own eyes fragments of the reality that cannot be grasped by the received words and actively present some materials to language, to thought, 
That's why we gave to provoke the subtitle provocative materials for thought. Close quote. Here is an example of Daido Moriyama's provoke era experiment known as accident. In 69, Daido Moriyama experimenting with the visual and conceptual effects of the photography as a reconstruction of photography published his series, Accident, every month from January to December in the, in the monthly Asahi Camera Journal. For this series, he often simply rephotographed found images, including posters, or directly photographed images that appeared on a television monitor, focused on the themes of disaster, traffic accidents, surveillance, and celebrity. In the magazine's June issue, as shown here, Moriyama contributed a seven-page photo essay titled Accident, which consists of his close-up shots of the Don't Drink and Drive poster made by Tokyo's Metropolitan Police Department that he found at the subway station. The poster made a strong impression on Moriyama, who in the late 1960s would snap photographs while driving in Tokyo. So in the Houston show, uh, we showed uh, the photographs from this series as well as selections of uh, magazine uh, uh, essays, uh, which appeared in uh, Asahi Journal. In his second book, Farewell Photography, published in 1972, Moriyama pushed the experimental philosophy and the aesthetics of Provoke to its limits, redefining the photographic medium. His search to photograph the experience of place rather than the place itself seems to take him to the edge of an existential void, replete with images of the formless and the abstract. The fragmentation of so many images, printed full page and running one into the next, gives the work a sense of speed that is underscored by the glimpses of phonetic contemporary life they depict. Many of the photographs portray subjects that carry a sense of time in their presence. Television, clocks, automobiles, trains, balance between durations and stasis, reminders of the passing of life all around. So Thomas Shomei was contemporary to the provoke photographers, but remained independent. And in his photographs, he examined Japan's sovereignty and America's colonizations in Japan in immediate possible years. Tomatsu who participated actively in a, in a discourse of examining Japan's sovereignty uh, in post four years, established a, a publishing house called Shaken. And Shaken published three important photo books by uh, Tomatsu, starting O Shinjuku, and Okinawa, 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 both published in 1969, and A Pencil of the Sun in 1975. He also published the, the journal called Ken, which means in Japanese, looking. Uh, although the Ken came out only three issues from 1970, to 71. Quarterly General Ken had a brief life from 1970 to 71, but only three issues. 
K was named after the sound of the Japanese word for seeing. Magazine's decentered nature was based on, in part, its guest editor system. For each issue, Thomas selected an editor with different views and experiences. The first issue was edited by an amateur photographer and recent university graduate. The second by the emerging photographer and amateur folklorist Masatoshi Naito. And the third by the well-known graphic designer and essayist Tsunesa Kimura. This selection reflected the Tomatsu ideal for democratic discourse and interdisciplinary interest in photography in what he called the era of border transgression. The magazine's inclusive nature offered a sharp contrast to provokes exclusivity. The first issue of Ken, titled Oh Bampaku, was published in 1970. Whereas Provoke's anti-expo stance was limited to a theoretical essay by Koji Taki, Ken took a broad anti-expo stance, manifested in the photographs that Tomatsu contributed to the issue, and the essays by members of Japan's cultural left, including the novelist uh, Akiyuki Nosaka and the film director Nagisa Oshima. Tomatsu's 32-page photo essay was intended to counter the flood of images at the Expo, where 70% of displays comprised visual materials, television, film, and photography, many of which were presented on multiple monitors and screens. Titled, That Bastard of Expo, the photo essay consists of photo montages made from some of his earlier and current photographs and other graphic elements. The second issue featured photographs by guest editor Masatoshi Naito, who infused the issue with his offbeat aesthetics and interest as a folklorist. In his high contrast black and white style, he captured grotesque outcasts female street performers swallowing a snake. Another critical voice against Provoke was heard from Sadan Kyushu through Chihei, a Fukuoka-based journal, edited and published by the photographer Koichi Kuronuma, taking the doujinshi format of a membership magazine. Chihei was inaugurated in April 1972 and ended with its 10th issue in, in September 1977. Its members included the photographer Shunji Dodo. For Chihei, its peripheral location inflected its politics of representation. So one of the provoked photographers, Yutaka Takanashi, created the book called uh, Toshie, Towards the city, which actually uh, includes his uh, evocative photographs, um, often shot while he was driving uh, from suburb to to the city of Tokyo in 1968 to 1973. Um, he produced also an iconic photo book uh, with the same title. After Provoke, Nakahira created uh, a very important, actually, time-based uh, installation photograph, circulation, date, place, events of 1971. It was a photographic and performative installation of approximately 1,500 snapshots he had produced for the Paris Biennale just over a week. So in, in this body of work, Nakahira uh, looked at his own presence from that specific uh, uh, time and place. This installation, uh, you know, every day gradually expanded uh, 
you know, added with the photographs uh, he had shot uh, a day before and developed overnight. In a Houston exhibition, this work was approximately uh, uh, reconstructed uh, with the selections of Nakahira's later prints created from the negatives of the images he produced in Paris in 1971. Jiro Takamatsu, who was a contemporary to uh, uh, Nakahira and also Takanashi, was known for his performance as a part of the hybrid center and the painting and sculpture. He was a part of the uh, uh, group of artists uh, uh, named Monoha, the school of things. Takamatsu was interested in the act of looking, but looking through a camera and created a, a couple important works from 1969 to 1973, in particular, uh, a shadow painting, the painting at your left, light and shadow, the sculpture in the center, and photograph for photograph, series of photographs at the right in this photograph. In photograph for photograph, Takamatsu presented a snapshot from his family album as an object or thing placed on the wall of his home. It's not about actually creating a beautiful image of snapshot, rather he wanted to reveal the materiality of the photograph in this series. Artist and filmmaker Nobu Yamanaka made a series of phenomenal photographic works uh, titled uh, A Pinhole Revolution, for which he turned his room into a camera obscura. He lined the walls with a large full sheet list films and exposed them to the light from a pinhole aperture, which projected an upside down view of the exterior streetscape. He made a large scale contact prints from the exposed films and then displayed them upside down as though recreating the room's walls. Yamanaka's pinhole room incorporated both a camera and his physical presence. Later, uh, Yamanaka made a, a smaller portable pinhole camera and he carried that around uh, in Manhattan when uh, he was in New York City in the early 1980s. I'm showing an installation view of work by Kanju Wakae, Nobu Yamanaka, Jiro Takamatsu, as shown in a Houston exhibition. Kanju Wakae makes paintings, sculptures, and installation. In 1972, he launched the Seeing and Looking, an ongoing photo based series in which he has examined the vision of photography and the way we see an object. In this series, that compares the real and the visual images, illusion becomes an object of study. This sense of visual deception is particularly evident in seeing and looking nails, made in 1974. In this work, he stuck nails onto a photograph of an object and then photographed it. So in this work, you see 12 smaller photographs. Some are the photographs of objects on which nails were struck directly, but some are 
the photographs of photographs on which nails were struck. So he's actually, uh, um, you know, testing uh, a viewer to see if he can figure out which one is which. Um, so that's Wakai's, Wakai's work. Wakai was also uh, into the practice of institutional critique, in particular, uh, critiquing Art Academy. So in this slide, I'm comparing work by Kanji Wakae with a work by Mel Buckner, American artist. Uh, both artists actually engage photography for institutional critique. They both measure actually the, the space or length of the gallery or uh, the entryway to the authoritative art museum. And they're basically uh, uh, simply uh, uh, stating the, the importance and also authority of those institutions uh, with the mere numbers, the figures, measure the figures. And in both works, you see uh, the number of the length is actually uh, wrote in in both works. So they also made uh, only uh, a few years apart from each other in uh, late 60s and early 70s. So this is a good example of uh, international contemporaneity, or what art historian Reiko Tomi called resonance, without any or very little actual connection. So this kind of actually a tendency complicates the study of a post-war art history. Kenji Uematsu is an Osaka-based sculptor. In 1973, Uematsu undertook a project for the 1973 Kyoto Independent Exhibition, where he positioned himself in the doorway of the gallery, sometimes holding heavy wood blocks. He then displayed photographs of his action on the gallery walls next to the doorways and responded to the strict geometries of monoha and minimalism. So in the Houston show, we installed uh, three pairs of his performance done in 1973, together with his sculpture uh, from the uh, also the early 1970s. Another artist who resorted to photography was sculptor Tatsuo Kawaguchi. Kawaguchi took a wooden plank about twice his height to Suma Beach in Kobe and set the wood down so that the very end of the plank was anchored on the shore as it extended at a lengthwise into the waves. It was just after sunrise and he repeated the process until four planks were floating on the waves a few feet apart from one another and only slightly touching the shore. The artist set up a tripod in the waves and snapped a picture. From this stationary vantage point, the boards were photographed throughout the day as the tide rolled in and out. Kawish noted the date and time in hours, minutes, and seconds that each photograph was taken over three days in 1970. This played at 1970 Kyoto Independent Exhibition at the Kyoto Municipal Museum of Art. Nomura Hitoshi's Time on the Curve Line consisted of 34 photographic prints. In this work, the artist documented the walk he took in the Kyoto suburb on February 22nd, 1970, from 9.44 a.m. to 5.16 p.m. He began the walk by making his starting point on the road 
And then when he had walked so far that this previous point was no longer visible, he stopped, marked the time on the surface of the road, and photographed this mark. Using a 6x6 six six Bronica camera, he systematically repeated this process, making 34 marks to note different moments in a single day. Representing the artist's ongoing ex experiments with the camera, which had begun in 1968, time on a curved line incorporates the complexities of time and space in a rather non-descriptive documentary mode. To Nomura, the work is a sculpture of his presence in a specific time and place. Here are the details of the 34 prints of this work, Time on the Curved Line. During the research, I also found a very interesting uh, a resonance between the work by Nomura, we discussed, and also American artist Vito Acconci's work. Vito's work was also made in the same year Nomura's work was made, which is 1970. So in Vito Acconci's work, he makes an estimation from point A to point B. Uh, he writes down first the estimate. And then when he walked to point B, he actually uh, uh, write down the actual uh, step uh, he took. So there's a gap between the estimations and also actuality. So his work also, uh, uh, you know, is about actually artist's own journey and also recording uh, such journey and also gap between, uh, you know, his action and also his thinking. So uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, resonance between two works. So the intersection of art and photography as a sign of international contemporaneity became tangible in May 1970 when the Mainichi newspaper company organized the 10th Tokyo Biennale subtitled Between Man and Matter at the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. This legendary exhibition, international in scope, showcased the work of 13 Japanese artists and 27 others, and informed Japanese audience about the latest trends in contemporary art. The works in exhibition were informed by dematerialization, conceptualism, and performativity, thereby cementing the place of photography in contemporary art. Yusuke Nakahara was the curator for, for this exhibition. In this uh, uh, spread of the uh, Biennale's catalog, we are looking at the work by uh, Japanese artist uh, Hitoshi Nomura. In this slide, on your left, you see the installation by Christo. He covered the floor of the museum. At your right, Dutch artist Jan David's installation of 34 photographs that observe the passing of time as seen through the shifting light casting his Amsterdam studio. In this review of the Tokyo Biennale, which appeared in uh, a Japanese uh, newspaper, viewers are simply looking for art. The review said actually, there's not, not much art in this ex exhibition. Where is art? Uh, this slide show work by Daniel Buran, the, the stripes, painted stripes in a public space. And also uh, at the right, there's a sculpture of uh, Jiro Takamatsu, who showed the sculptures in the Tokyo Biennale. Another young Japanese artist who participated in the Biennale was Koji Enokura. In the Biennale, Enokura poured uh, oil onto the floor 
where he had laid out square papers in various sizes and produced a wet floor. From early in his career, Enokura consistently illuminated the corporeal relationship with the matter as revealed on the surface. The result is a unmediated space or image that is at once flat and sensuous, intimating a contact between liquid and solid matter. Enokura responded to objects with a corporeal sensitivity as seen in his images of wet surfaces, a subject he returned to repeatedly. In these photographs, you can see uh, the oil poured on, on a wall in a picture at your left, and also uh, water uh, sprinkled on, on the ground in the picture at your right. He made the work two stains at your left. By photographing an actual stain and converting the photo into a silk screen and printing it on cloth, the image of the stain and the use of the pigment are both repeated, first to stain cloth and then to print the image on the cloth. And this is actually an installation photograph of sections where Enokura showed two stains and also photographs in the Houston exhibition. Continuing on the creations and depictions of a wet space, but now back to the photographer Takuma Nakahira. I want to speak a little bit on his installation from early 70s, Overflow. So this is a group of color prints of surfaces. Uh, many actually surfaces are wet, uh, which he found on a street. He aimed at no specific narrative or sequence. Instead, he eschewed darkroom manipulation, which had once been integral to his practice and they evaluated the documentary functions of photography. Here, Nakahira simply cherished the color prints made in the photography lab by technicians as the end product. In terms of presentation format, overflow as an installation of numerous prints signaled a significant shift from the photographer's convention of making standard size black and white photographs for print publications and also installation. Nakahira shared Enokura's interest in physical relationship with the surfaces through photography. This is actually the details of the Nakahira's work, Overflow. I want to talk about the works by two women artists, one in Kobe and the other in New York. The early work by Kazuo Kinoshita, who was best known as a painter, was primarily photography based. While living in Kobe, she began to explore the medium in 1973, responding to its capacity to provide a layered sense of time. That's represented in her self-portrait as left, which consists of um, multiple photographs, which are shot on a different date. In a highly conceptual series of photographs made from 1976 to 1980, she pushed against the limits of two-dimensionality. Kinoshita crumpled, folded, or curled pieces of paper, transforming them into three-dimensional object, and then use the felt-tipped pen or acrylic paint to add colored lines and geometric forms that interact with the shape of the paper. She then photographed the resulting objects. Capturing the added depths, she drew the same lines or forms precisely onto the corresponding location in a photographic print the spatial difference 
between the modified paper and the two-dimensional surface of the photograph is emphasized in the areas in which the added lines and forms of the two do not align, yet add to the seeming depth of space. Having graduated from art school in Chicago in 1967, Kunia Segura moved to New York City the same year. She turned at this time to photo emulsion techniques, a process in which chemicals harden when exposed to light. Photo emulsion can be painted onto any surface, including fabric, glass, ceramics, and metal on which photographic images can directly be printed. Sugiura was one of the first artists to incorporate the materiality of the photo emulsion in her studio practice by applying the emulsion solution directly to raw canvas, much like a painter would apply gesso, and then using an enlarger to expose the canvas to black and white images that she had taken of New York. As a lit section of the canvas darkened and hardened, Segura was left with an image on canvas that emulated the scale and texture of the painting. Many of the Segura's photographs were of patches of nature in the city, such as trees and rocks. She emphasized the formal aspects of the subject in such a way that images fluctuate between abstraction and representation. For example, Central Park 3 records the surface of a rock found in Central Park. The rough surface of the large seven foot wide canvas was layered with the gestural marks amplified by artist drawing in graphite. As the series progressed, Sugiura assembled multiple printed canvas canvases into sculptural installation. Deadpan Street at left is nearly 10 feet across and includes canvas painted black along the photographic canvases of a street underneath the elevated rail line, one showing a flooded street under the rail, another bacon and dry. By converting the skylines, streets, walls, and bridges into formal structures, she offered a reductive meditations on the cityscape. Known primarily for his large-scale public sculpture, Masahumi Maita integrated photography into his sculptural practice in the 1970s. In situation one on view, the strict horizontality of the neon tube underscores the flat horizon where ocean meets sky in the photograph behind it. The hazy light cast by the tube highlights the texture of the under undulating waves beneath, which appear to glow from within the depicted landscape, producing uncanny relationship between the two that does not make sense in the context of the represented landscape or in the gallery space. The neon tube is absurdly oversized for the landscape. It doubles the purpose of the gallery lights by illuminating the photograph only bizarrely from within the borders. Due to its placement, the neon tube resembles a setting sun casting its rays on the water. Photographer Hitoshi Yamazaki focuses on the camera as apparatus in both his photography and filmmaking, especially in his early period. In a series, Heliography, picture at your left, which he began in 1974, Yamazaki directed the camera on a calm, nondescript sea and captured the moment of the sun through a long exposure by using a special filter that reduced the light to 400th of its strength. The shining trace of light in the sky and the intensity of the reflection on the water in gradation indicates the movement of the sun. Through its narrowly defined subject matter and minimal visual language, his photography 
generates a rigorous composition that verges on abstraction. In 1971, Nobuyoshi Araki self-published a record of his honeymoon with his newlywed wife, Yoko Aoki, titled Sentimental Journey. So I'm showing a spread uh, from this uh, photo book, uh, Sentimental Journey. This really shows uh, a, a really personal uh, uh, snapshots of his uh, honeymoon with his wife, Yoko, all actually uh, are seen and also presented by the artist eye perspective. This is a very new uh, a way of uh, approaching one's uh, intimacy uh, at that time. But before uh, this photo came out, Araki uh, did an interesting uh, uh, a Xerox photo book making. While working at the major advertising agency, Dentsu, Araki had access to a Xerox machine in office. He was one of the first artists to make use of the photocopying process due to this unique access. In collaboration with his uh, office colleagues, his brother Kazuo and his future wife Yoko, Araki used Xerox photo albums to work through many of the ideas that would later appear in the sentimental journey, including marriage, reproduction, and a singular personal perspective. Araki set out to publish 25 volumes of Xerox albums in limited editions of 70, with their black covers bound in red thread with the stub binding techniques that closed albums appear to be Japanese books. However, Araki took advantage of the thin format to make mail art and sent copies to random addresses taken from his photo book. Among the concepts invested in the intersection of photography and art in early 70s, two of the most frequently discussed strategies were fukusei, which means reproduction, and duplication, and inyo, meaning quotation and appropriation. Widespread use of the camera, and to a lesser extent of the copy machine, as an alternative to the camera, led artists and photographers to begin creating works that involved mechanically copying part or all of an existing work made by others. With the advent of late modern information society, the act of copying became a popular theme and technique in art and photography. So uh, this slide shows a cover page of the monthly corporate journal of Fuji Xerox company called uh, Graphication, inaugurated in January 1969. Um, you see the uh, art, uh, which is a fragmented image made by Jiro Takamatsu uh, using a Xerox machine. And the image at your right is uh, a work of art uh, Takamatsu uh, created again uh, by placing and photocopying sand and the black and white strings on the Xerox machines glass surface. So this uh, uh, journal uh, made by uh, Fuji Xerox Corporation was the, one of the platforms for artists who pursued making art using a Xerox machine. While the various photographic experiments continued, there had emerged a new trend in snapshot photography called Compora, short for contemporary photography. The term was coined by photographer Kyoji Otsuji 
in his 1968 essay titled The Age of Ism is Passing. For Otsuji, typical Kompora photographers shared certain formal and political characteristics. The horizontal format, the disk of snapshot style, and the lack of ideology. So one of the uh, photographers whose work can be considered as part of the Kompora style, photographer based in Okinawa, Kenshichi Heshiki. Heshiki, between 1972 and his death in 2009, focused his lens on a people living on the margin of Okinawa in both the prefecture's capital city, Naha, and on its remote islands. By tracing their lives, he revealed the history of photography specific to Okinawa, which is a distinct colonial narrative. Okinawa reverted from the United States back to Japan in 1972, the year Heshiki completed his college study of photography in Tokyo and returned home to Okinawa. So let's take a look at the uh, 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 image, uh, two images here. They both are landscape and they both are, uh, you know, horizontally uh, uh, oriented. And uh, picture at your left, you see two, two people in a, in a foreground. Uh, at the picture at your right, you see a cow in the center. None of neither picture is a uh, uh, you know political statement of any any. Unlike actually many of the pictures uh, we saw at the beginning of this uh, presentation, for Heshiki, um, these pictures were kind of quiet uh, reflections of his uh, being at the specific time and also space uh, in early 70s in Okinawa. I'm showing six snapshots made by uh, Heshiki, uh, which are shown in the Houston exhibition. He also photographed actually people as well, but again, just kind of snapshots. So, um, you know, people he, he see, he finds in a street or uh, people he knows as a very, um, you know, non-descriptive images. Um, but they're beautiful and uh, they're contemporary in a sense. Young photographer Shigeo Gocho was a student of Kyoji Otsuji. Gocho, the second book, Self and Others, published in 1977, heightens the viewer's awareness of looking. Awareness that arises from the confrontation of return glance and occasionally from the refusal to meet that gaze. Perhaps due to his physical disabilities, Gocho was highly attuned to connection and distances that could be captured through photographic portraits. For self and others, Gocho expressed an interest in daily life not simply as a way to understand the world changing around him, but to understand his own relativity. Taken primarily in the suburbs, the portraits in self and others are plainly staged, with most of the subject centered in the frame at some distance from the camera, facing the photographer. Whether photographing friends or strangers, Gocho welcomed the relationship and yet maintained the distance. Gocho's next and final book, Familiar Street Scenes, published in 1981, marks a significant departure from the style of portraits for which he had become known, though he did continue to pair subjects occasionally. He used color film for the first time 
and sort out fleeting formal patterns in a bustle and flow of the streets of downtown Tokyo while moving closer to his subjects, which he then presented in larger bold prints. The diminished distance between the photographer and his subject leads to a more confrontational relationship. Though some return his gaze, their expressions convey abolishment rather than a shared acceptance. With a background in textile, Miyakuchi, which has always been drawn to the personal, ritual aspects of photography. As a woman walking around the city, her hometown alone, Ishiuchi was afraid to venture onto certain streets that she had been told to avoid as a little girl. She felt the psychological imprint of her childhood in dark, gritty Yokosuka and soon began photographing inside the city's familiar post-war apartment complexes to explore the fictions of memory. Her series apartment from 1977 to 78 scrutinized memories of lives spent in close quarters in these cramped, crumbling buildings. Ishiuchi grew up in a similar apartment with her family of four coexisting in one room. She saw in these apartment buildings invisible traces, an index of lives she could have lived. And in the Houston show, uh, we showed her uh, apartment prints, the large prints, uh, together with her uh, photo book, um, including a Yokosuka story and also the apartment. Ishiuchi is a, a, a really great uh, a printer of photographs and also a photo book maker. So, um, you know, contemporary to uh, Ishiuchi was the photographer uh, Keizo Kitajima. Kitajima, together with uh, photographers Seiji Kurata and Daido Moriyama established a collective and also space, it's an independent space, known Image Shop Camp in the Shinjuku section of downtown Tokyo in 1979. At this photographer-run independent gallery, Kitajima would transform the space into a dark room every month and project images that he had just shot of streets directly onto the bromide paper on the walls and then fix them with a sponge. After each darkroom session, he lined the gallery walls from floor to ceiling with the photographs that he had just printed. He would arrange smaller prints in an impromptu grid format on or simply post and large prints, inviting audiences to view them immediately afterward. Eschewing conventional printing and display practices, these temporary exhibitions assumed a distinct performative dimension. So from this monthly performance, uh, Kitajima also uh, uh, made uh, a photo zine, actually, which uh, is made up of only uh, 16 pages. And then, uh, you know, he put uh, uh, many copies of the zine uh, into mail so that they serve as uh, uh, Kitajima's mail art. It was a very interesting um, uh, you know, one year long uh, project which took place in this independent space at the end of 1970s. Although atypical at the time, Kitajima's art practice was very experimental, conceptual, and performative, which 
were the characteristic aspects of Gendai Bijutsu that are still relevant in today's contemporary art and photographic practice in Japan. So Kitajima's uh, uh, performance, photo making, and also male art, I think, you know, is uh, carried on uh, in a in a group of artists uh, 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 active now, uh, such as uh, Daisuke Yokota. So Yokota acknowledged that uh, his uh, inspiration was indeed uh, uh, late sixties into seventies experimental, you know, photography. Uh, started by artists like uh, uh, Nakahira and also uh, uh, Moriyama. Um, so he's in a, a lineage of the 70s experimental practice. Born in 1983, Yokota is a part of a generation of artists using photography in, in new experimental subversive ways. His approach combines multiple re-photographing and printing, applying acid or flames to uh, films or the papers, and then making unique pr prints and books from unexpected materials, often in stage performances. Yokota is working out of and pushing forward a, a Japanese tradition of experimental photography and also photo book making um, that harks back to the visceral experimentation of the provoke generation. The work of the relentless uh, uh, street photographer and also uh, uh, photo maker, uh, Daido Moriyama in particular. I want to conclude my talk, um, you know, emphasizing, reiterating the importance of the moment uh, where photography and also art merged uh, through their experimental projects, uh, starting late 60s into 70s, um, which is still ongoing and also with the digital technologies and the other development in techniques and also concepts. I think many more artists will still use photography as part of the experimental work while lens-based photographers also are challenging uh, the work they uh, created in the past. I think photography is, in a way, uh, it's not only it's a crisis moment, but also uh, there are ample opportunities for the art which involve photography to continue to expand and also uh, complicate. Um, I hope you will enjoy Art Week Tokyo.